Assalamu alaikum. Welcome all to today's lecture. That is going to be the, about the outbreak management for multiple drug organisms. In this lecture, or in today's lecture, we are going to be able to define what is meant by the MDRO. Also, we will get to know about the different types of the multiple drug resistant organisms and the impact of multiple drug resistant organisms on the healthcare settings and patients, as well as the different ways of transmission of the MDROs. And also we will get to know about these strategies and clinical practices that is used for preventing of the multiple drug resistant organisms and also the surveillance of MDROs, types of surveillance used for the multiple drug resistant organisms and the infection prevention and control measures used also to prevent the transmission of the multiple drug resistant organisms. And we will get to know also about the environmental cleaning and disinfection used in prevention of MDROs. So without further ado, let's just get started. I'd like to start with the introduction or the definition of multiple drug resistant organism. What is meant by the MDRO? What, what do those four letters stand for? The MDROs stands for the multiple drug resistant organisms. So we, we, we need to be aware of, we need to be familiar with multiple definitions related to the multiple drug resistant organisms. First is the MDROs, it stands for the microorganisms. These microorganisms mainly and predominantly bacteria that are resistant to one or more classes of the antimicrobial agents. And the antimicrobial classes is the or are the categories or groups of antimicrobial agents. And the ability of the microbes for example, the ability of the bacteria to defeat the drug that is designed to kill them or designed to inactivate them is called antimicrobial resistance. Now, there are some, some bacteria that are referred as the extensive drug resistance or XDR. It means that the antimicrobial agents or sorry, the microorganisms that have the ability to resist all antimicrobial agents with the exception of two or fewer antimicrobial agents, they are called XDR. So these microorganisms would be resistant to all antimicrobial agents except two or fewer agents. They would be susceptible to those two uh, agents. These are called XDR. Now, another definition or another term that we need to be aware of is the PDR or pan drug resistant organisms. Now, in this category, the microorganisms that, has, that are called PDR would be resistant to all antimicrobial agents. Another type is called the ESBL or extended spectrum beta lactamase, and this is a name of an enzyme that is released by some of the microorganisms or bacteria that has the ability or capable of resisting the most beta-lactam antibiotics that include the penicillins, cephalosporins, and monobactams. Now, if we move to the effect or before the effect, we move to the types of the MDROs. We know that although some of the names of the MDROs might give you the the hint of being resistant to only one antimicrobial agent. For example, the MRSA, that stands for the methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus, it is, or, or the VR, VRE, that is vancomycin resistant enterococci, despite of, of having one antimicrobial agent in their names, they, those pathogens are frequently resistant to most available antimicrobial agents. So, types of the multidrug resistant organisms, as we may all know, we've got the MRSA, VRE, CRE, and ESPLs. Also, another type is the Pseudomonas aeruginosa, Clostridium difficile, and Candida auris, and so on and on. 
So moving to the impact of the MDROs, actually the, the MDROs have, have a huge impact on the healthcare settings and patients as well. Those consequences of the uh, MDROs includes limiting the treatment options available for patients. Also, it increases or it prolongs the hospital stay or the admission to the ICUs. Also, it increases the cost. The impact of the MDROs have a huge impact, have a huge role on the uh, cost of the treatments, as well as increasing the case fatality rates. Also, one of the impacts of the MDROs uh, is that it is it has been proven that it is implicated it is it is responsible up to 70 percent of the healthcare associated infections and um, also it, it is it is also resistant the antimicrobial resistance is also implicated in at least 208 million illnesses and 35 deaths in the u.s each year So, if we, if we talk about the transmission of the MDROs, obviously the transmission of the MDROs or multiple drug resistant organisms have different way of transmission, mainly by the hand, hands of healthcare personnel or hand, hands of, of caregivers. Also, it has been proven that some of the microorganisms have the ability of surviving on, on, on the environmental services. So MDROs can transmit from the hands of, hand, hands of the healthcare workers, can be transmitted from patients to patients, can be transmitted through clinical services. So all of these are ways of transmission of the MDROs and we will get to know them in this presentation. Now, if we talk about the surveillance and early detection of the MDROs, actually there have been some strategies in surveillancing of MDROs. Those strategies involving the infection prevention and accurate and prompt diagnosis and treatment, that is also a strategy of uh, detection of the MDRO and surveilling of the MDRO. Also the judicious use of antimicrobial of antimicrobials is another 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 uh, strategy of surveillance of MDROs as well as prevention of transmission of the MDROs. Now the preventing of infection. We know that preventing of, of, of the infection will reduce the burden of the MDROs in healthcare settings. And by preventing the antimicrobial resistance, we'll, by preventing the antimicrobial resistance, will depend on the appropriate clinical practices that have to be put in place and have to be and should be incorporated in, into all our routine care patients. And that, that includes the optimal management of vascular and urinary catheters. These are examples of the clinical practices that have to be put in place to reduce the antimicrobial resistance. And it involves as, uh, as well as the prevention of the lower respiratory tract infection in intubated patients, as well as the accurate diagnosis of infectious etiologies and judicious antimicrobial selection and utilization. Now, these strategies can be defined as a group of bundled evidence-based clinical practices that have been implemented in the healthcare facilities to reduce the central line associated bloodstream infections and ventilator associated events. By implementing these practices, by, by putting in place these clinical practices, we, are, we, we should be able actually to decrease the, the healthcare associated infections. And um, by decreasing the healthcare associated infections, we will be able to reduce the antimicrobial use and therefore thus reducing the opportunities for the, emerging and, for the emergence and transmission of the MDROs. Now, we're reaching the surveillance of the MDROs. If we'd like to talk about the surveillance of MDROs, actually surveillance is a huge 
component of any MDRO control program. It plays a huge role, allowing us to detect any emerging pathogens. Also, it, al it allows us to monitor any epidemiologic trends, also measuring the effectiveness of our intervention. And also the surveillance of MDRO actually have been employed uh, that ranges, surveillance of MDROs ranges between, or ranges from the clinical microbiology laboratory results that is obtained as part of routine clinical air up to the active surveillance cultures to detect the asymptomatic colonization. And we will get to know every one of those types of surveillance in this presentation. Now, if we start with the first type of surveillance of the MDROs, that is the type that is obtained from the routine clinical cultures. And this is considered the simplest, the simplest form of the MDRO surveillance, is to monitor, monitor the clinical microbiology isolates uh, that, is, that is resulting or requested from, uh, as a part of the routine clinical care. And the advantages of this type of surveillance that it allows us or it helps us to detect any emergence of a newly MDROs that has not been previously detected. Also, it, it helps us to describe the prevalence of the pathogen specific in clinical isolates. Also, one of the advantages of this type of surveillance that it provides information to guide the antimicrobial prescribing practices. Now, the incidence of MDRO that is based on the clinical culture results, this is another form of the surveillance of the MDRO. And this time, we calculate the incidence of MDROs in specific population or in specific patient care locations. For example, I'd like to calculate the new MDRO isolates over 1,000 patient days. So in this type of, of surveillance, we would be able to monitor the trends of the MDROs as well as to evaluate and assess the impact of prevention programs. Now, as a drawbacks, as a drawbacks or disadvantage of this type of surveillance, that it is based only on the positive culture results without any accompanying clinical information. Also, we are not able, we would not be able to distinguish between the colonization and infection with this type of surveillance. Also, the, this type may not fully demonstrate the burden of MDRO-associated disease, associated disease. So this is the limitations or disadvantages or drawbacks of this type of surveillance. Moving to another type of surveillance of the MDROs is the type that where we detect the asymptomatic colonization. This is another form of MDRO surveillance, and it is used to detect any active uh, surveillance uh, cultures. It is used to identify any patients who are colonized with any of the targeted MDROs. It has been proven, it has been found that this type of surveillance is able to decrease the transmission of VRE by 39%. Also, it has been proven that it has led to a successful control of MRSA, even when the MRSA is endemic in some settings. Also, the active surveillance cultures have been used as a part of the efforts to successful control of MDRO gram-negative bacilli in outbreak settings. So this is another form of the surveillance that is used in MDRO surveillance. Now, the active surveillance cultures should be considered in some settings, especially if other control measures have been ineffective, if we are not able to control the uh, MDRO transmission by the other means, we should consider using the active surveillance cultures. Now, the decision of use active surveillance cultures as part of infection prevention and control programs requires additional support for successful implementation. We need the following additional uh, re, um, practices to ensure, act, uh, to ensure um, implementation of active surveillance cultures. This Im uh, involves the personnel 
first we need to have the personnel to obtain the appropriate cultures in order to uh, implement the active surveillance cultures as well as the microbiology laboratory personnel to process the cultures also the mechanism of communicating of results to caregivers have to be maintained during this type of in this type of, of surveillance also the um, decisions or concrete decisions about the use of additional isolation measures triggered by the positive cultures for example contact precautions have to be used in this type of uh, surveillance also we need to assess the adherence of the additional isolation measures there's been we need to have a mechanism of assuring the adherence to these uh, practices there and use the active surveillance cultures now the population the population that we target for using or for implementing the active surveillance cultures can be varying could, could vary from uh, healthcare settings to another some investigators have chosen to target specific patient populations considered at risk of MDRO colonization based on multiple factors. We could target, for example, the ICU patients with high MDRO rates. We could target patients of, uh, of, of a prolonged, patients who have, who, have, uh, who have prolonged duration of stay, for example. We could target the exposure to other MDRO colonized patients, or we could target patients trans transferred from other facilities known to have a high prevalence of MDRO carriage. So the populations that we target in the active surveillance cultures may vary from healthcare facility to another. Now, if you'd like to talk about the infection prevention and control measures that should be used in prevention of transmission of the multi of MDRO multidrug resistant organisms, we should talk about the hand hygiene, which is the most effective or the most important infection prevention and control measure during when we are talking about prevention of transmission of MDROs. As we may all know that the healthcare workers' hands are the most common vehicle for transmission of healthcare associated pathogens from one patient to another patient within the healthcare environment. So the hand hygiene is the leading measure for preventing the spread of antimicrobial resistance and reducing the healthcare associated infection. The only obstacle or only issue that we have is the compliance of the healthcare personnel or healthcare givers to the hand hygiene. And we all know that the healthcare workers contaminate their hands by touching the environment or by touching the patient's skin during their routine care activities. Sometimes even despite using the gloves, it has been shown, it has been proven that the microorganisms are capable of surviving on the clinical surfaces. So hand hygiene practices have to be optimal because if they are suboptimal, the microbial colonization is more easily established and direct transmission to the patients or a fomite in a direct contact with the patients may occur. So based on the evidence and the demonstration of its effectiveness, optimal hand hygiene behavior is considered the cornerstone of healthcare associated infection prevention. It is also proven that it is not only a key element of standard and isolation precautions, but it, it plays also a huge role in uh, preventing some of the device associated infections like the central line associated bloodstream infection and the catheter related urinary tract infection and surgical site infection as well as the ventilator associated pneumonia. So moving to another infection prevention and control measure that is as important as the hand hygiene is the contact precautions. And we know that the contact precautions are intended to prevent the transmission of infectious agents. And it, it, we have to be, to be following the contact precautions when dealing either directly or indirectly with, with patients or patients' environments. For instance, if a patient 
has to be isolated. It has he has to be isolated in a single room. Single room is always preferred for patients who require contact precautions. But when a single room is not available, we have to consider um, putting or isolating the patients with other patient placements under of course under the the blessing under the consultation of the infection prevention and control department and we know that the healthcare personnel caring for patients who have been isolated under the contact precautions should wear a gown and a glove for all the interactions that may involve contact with the patient or potentially contaminated areas in the patient's environment and we know that taking off or, don, or, or doffing the, the gown and gloves have to be discarded before, the, before leaving the existing patient's room. And especially, especially if we are dealing with patients who have been infected with some of the MDROs that have or capable of transmission through environmental contamination, such as the VRE or Clostridium difficile. So please do not underestimate the rule of the hand hygiene and contact precautions. They should not be taken lightly. They play a huge ro role. They have a huge impact in preventing the transmission of the MDROs. Now, another measures of the infection prevention and control in, 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 in preventing the MDRO transmission is the environmental cleaning as, and disinfection. As we all know, some of the microorganisms are capable of surviving on clinical services. It has been proven that they are uh, capable of surviving on, on clinical services. And we know that the patients could be infected. For example, if we've got a patient who is infected or colonized with, a, with, a, with, a, with an infection or with an MDRO, he is capable of transmitting the infection to a new patient through the contaminated hand hygiene, or sorry, through the contaminated hand of healthcare worker. So in order to break this chain, a proper hand hygiene has, ha, has to be followed and the proper environmental cleaning. The, by those two means, we are able to break this chain or through the transmission routes. Now, we've got to be familiar with some of the definitions that we need to be aware of. First is the cleaning. What is meant by cleaning? Cleaning refers to the physical removal of the foreign material or the organic material. For example, foreign, mat uh, foreign removal, physical removal sorry, of the dust and oil, as well as blood secretions, excretions. This is called cleaning, whereas the disinfection describes the process that eliminates many or all of the pathogen organisms with the exception of the bacterial spores that are not being removed by the disinfection itself. Now the cleaning is subdivided into two other types. I'm pretty sure that you have been exposed to this in other lectures, but anyway, the routine cleaning is the regular cleaning when the room is occupied by a patient or by removing the organic material or reducing the microbial contamination and provide a visually clean environment. Whereas the terminal cleaning is the cleaning and disinfection after the patient has been discharged or transferred. Now, the disinfectants that we are using, disinfectants in general are chemical compounds that have the ability to inactivate or kill the pathogens and other microbes. The cleaning, we have to remember that the, we have to remember that the cleaning is the first step prior to any disinfection or sterilization. Now, the contact time means that the time that a disinfectant must be in contact with the service or device to ensure that appropriate disinfection has occurred. Now, as we all know that the services are subdivided into two major types or two main types. We've got the high touch services and low touch services. The high touch services would involve the bed rails and call bell, and those are frequently touched by the healthcare workers. Whereas the low touch services, those are not 
as frequently as touched as the high touch surfaces and they may include the ceilings and floors and the high touch surfaces may may be potential reservoirs may serve as reservoirs for the microorganisms now this is a picture involving or demonstrating the high touch surfaces as you may can know we've got the bellow we've got the uh, electricity outlet we've got the uh, telephone for example the chairs all of these and and are the high high touch surfaces or items where are where, whereas the low touch surfaces or items including the floors and the ceilings now we've got to remember the disinfectant hierarchy we've got microbial disinfectant hierarchy that involves three level of disinfection we've got the high level disinfection mid level disinfection and low, low level of of disinfection for example with bacterial spores we know for example the clostridium difficile are not disinfected or requires disinfection high level disinfection followed by the mycobacteria mycobacterium tuberculosis and so on from the most resistant to the most susceptible now we're going to talk about the another one of the infection and prevention measures um, or one of the means that is used to prevent the transmission of the MDROs is the antimicrobial stewardship programs as you may all know that the antimicrobial stewardship program is a coordinated program that aims to uh, the appropriate use of antimicrobials including the antibiotics also, it aims to improve the patient outcomes. It aims to reduce the microbial resistance and to decrease the spread of infection caused by the multidrug resistant organisms. The, we know that the misuse and overdose of antimicrobials is one of the world's most pressing public health problems. And the infectious organisms adapt to the antimicrobials designed to kill them. So as a result, those drugs are becoming ineffective and people infected with the antimicrobial resistant organisms are more likely to have a longer stay at the hospitals more expensive treatments and maybe more likely to die as a result of an infection that's why the rule and the the the, the importance of the antimicrobial stewardship programs that have to be implemented as a mean, as a huge mean, as a cornerstone of preventing the MDROs. It involves multiple steps, actually. The, MD, the anti, antimicrobial stewardship programs have multiple features. As we, as we talked, it, it minimizes the source of infection. It involves prescribing antimicrobials only when indicated. It, it involves also selecting antimicrobials rationally with precise dosage schedule it also monitors the antimicrobial consumption. It, it involves regular educational intervention among healthcare professionals. It promotes interdisciplinary strategies. It improves the infection prevention and control program. Now we're reaching the MDRO reporting. When do we have to report the MDRO? Now, if the second blood specimen Remember now, here the, the specimen is a blood. If the second specimen showing the same organism that have appeared in the first specimen, in a period less than 14 days, there is no need to report this MDRO. But if the period is exceeding the 14 time, 14 day period, we have to report the MDRO even if the same organism have appeared in the two specimens. Now if the second specimen have been collected more than or has have been have been more than 30 days we have always to report the MDRO. Now this is in the situation or in the case of having the same organism in a blood sample. Now if we have different organisms if the organisms in the second specimen is different from the first specimen and the specimen here is a blood we have to report it even if it is in a period less than 14 days 
because the organism is different. If it is more than 14 days, also we've got to report it. And obviously, we have always to report it if it is more than 30 days in all specimens, either in blood or non-blood specimens. Now, if the first other specimens, that means specimens that not uh, other than blood, if the same organisms have appeared in the second specimen in a period less than 14 days or even after 14 days, there is no need to MDR. Uh, there is no need to report this MDR all, but it has to be reported if the period is exceeding or more than 30 days. But if the organism is different, we have to report the MDROs in all situations. I hope this is clear to you to, um, to demonstrate or to explain when do we have to report the MDROs. Now I'd like to conclude this presentation by the possible possible causes of the failure of the MDRO prevention and control. There are so many causes that contributing to the failure of MDRO prevention. It involves lack of compliance with hand hygiene. Also, it, it involves lack of education, non-prudent use of anti, 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 antibiotics. That means the use of antibiotics is not judicious or too low healthcare staffing. We know shortage, shortage of staff also one of the could be one of the contributing factor to the failure of prevention of MDRO, lack of financial resources, lack of diagnostics and typing and screening, lack of isolation capacity, wrong or incompletely implemented MDRO prevention bundles could be another cause. Also sources of the MDRO outside the healthcare facility, density of healthcare and usage of healthcare facilities, transfer of patients between healthcare institutions, lack of outbreak control, and delayed begin of bundle implementations. All of these could be contributing factors of failure of MDRO prevention and control that we have to be aware of, we have to be familiar with. Thank you for listening, and you are going to be given more lectures about particular organisms by Miss Iman and her team. Thank you for watching.